for, for demonstrating why the economy needs to become more demand driven in order to be successful. And next, we will have welcoming a great lineup of global experts who are interested to look at the past, the present, and the future of fairness in data driven business. And we will think about what is the role of data sovereignty in this all. And we have five speakers joining us. And welcome on the stage, Jana Sinipura from Sophie Gate and Marianne Terbin from Innovate. And from online we are, are we have joining us uh, Marcel Nongu from R4 Leadership and Chris Chen from Shenzhen and SD Technology Limited. And also we have Dixon Xu from Fujitsu Limited and Personium. Thank you for uh, all of you guys uh, joining us and the stage is yours. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so good morning to everyone and uh, please come to the to the scene, because uh, this session is mainly moderated or just moderated by me and I managed to gather a stunning panel of the global or international participants. So for those of you who are wondering who I am, um, I'm here at the Citra stage telling about the experiences about building our fair data economy uh, those years that when I was working at Citra as a project director in, in building the fair data economy concepts, working together with the authorities and commission and my, my great uh, uh, team members across, across the world. So today we will focus on, on sharing our personal views because um, I and uh, I let all these panelists introduce themselves later. Um, I'm sure that you've seen the bios there, there's lots of information there. But just briefly, today we will focus on, on the personal views on this development. We will shortly discuss about the past, show some practical examples from the present, and then focus on discussing about the future. So, um, the idea for this presentation came from the, from the researcher who addressed me and interviewed me while, while at Citra, uh, and then publishing a publication called Population as Brands. So, claiming that all these uh, actions, what we are doing with authorities and regulators, are we just trying to repeat the same business models like GAFAM companies are doing? Are we building uh, businesses based on regulated data? Are we just focusing on the regulations? So I thought that surely there's a lot of learnings we can take from other, other continents and other people. And for sure we must break the bubbles and break the silos. Uh, it can't be just like good tech guys changing after the guys with the bad tech. We need to change the whole paradigm. So going further, I think it's time good time to focus on uh, analyzing the past because it's very long time if they want to change to make a systemic change it's going to take ages but we are in a good good shape we are in a good move and i think that with giving a good faces to the to the data economy we can change the future so i start uh, with a simple question uh, what comes to your mind when you think about data, just one word, quickly. Um, but I will first start uh, from our African representative. So Marcel, please introduce yourself by telling a little bit about your, yourself. Hopefully you will. Yes. Hello. Good morning. And welcome. I'm really, I'm really happy to, to be there with you. Um, I'm Marcel and um, I'm part of Afro Leadership, a civil society organization. We work mainly on um, 
awareness and system participation in building the nation in Africa and mainly in Cameroon. So we work out like on the financial uh, transparency, uh, personal data, and other other um, activity related to the AU agenda for the building in Africa. That's in a nutshell what we are doing. So to answer, is it, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. So to answer your question, when we talk, when, when I heard about data for me and for us, it's just like opportunity. That's some opportunities for us. So even right now we don't have all the all the like the requirement. However, we are looking at it like like really an opportunity for for each African country. Like that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Marcel. And then let's move to Dixon. I think you are now in Cambodia working on the children's um, educational initiatives, but what comes to your mind when you think about data? And tell about a little bit about your personal background, being one of the pioneers in, in my data. Yes, um, as you might know from my bio, it's shorter than that. Uh, I'm also um, kind of a uh, Evangelist for, for this um, market idea uh, in Jiu-Jitsu and also with Afro leadership and uh, different hubs in Asia. Um, that's basically what I do. I, I try to help out and then uh, satisfy every stakeholders. So what comes in mind when I hear data is uh, everyone um, do, do what everyone is important. You know, we have to include the children, uh, keeping them, and also the uh, global South citizens. So um, I really like the word uh, the sense of making uh, one behind. So that's one of my uh, favorite ones. Thank, thank you, John. Thanks, Dixon. Everyone, that's very good for this demand-driven future of, of fair data economy. And then over to Chris. Um, please. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, one word uh, to describe a bit is collaboration. Uh, to describe uh, that school. Uh, I've been uh, in a big tech uh, entrepreneur uh, in, in China, Hong Kong, and Asia for the past 20 years. So, uh, so uh, the whole of the development of the data analytics uh, and usage uh, is going through the journey uh, of the pollution. Thank you. It's now that we are going to end this as a big question. Thanks. And now, if I get those timelines back there from the presenters, can I get the screen back to you? So, I basically, when we started planning this session, we, were, we wanted to draft a timeline about those essential events in every, uh, across the globe, uh, what has happened. Uh, but then we find out that it's very tricky. Either you need to list every privacy-related regulation, or you need to uh, you need to list everything that's that's uh, on the digital strategy. So so it's very demanding. And I guess one of the one of the future um, success factors will be breaking those bubbles and make, making things more relevant to each and every every one of us going beyond the regula regulations and going be be beyond the individual uh, events. I think there's lots of commonalities we can see when we are making this journey across the continents, uh, similar things happening. We've seen uh, lots of uh, ch things ch happening in China as well, privacy protection, lots of regulation about algorithms, so, and also the Africa is, is taking big steps in the my data thinking, not to speak about open, open, open banking and open data initiatives and also the Japanese information banks and what's happening in Japan with the privacy acts. So, uh, uh, what I would like to do now is to focus on, on the co commonalities between these different progresses. So all these slides will be will be available for you in the background material, um, and uh, they are not complete, but they are a very good very good uh, kind of summary how we feel as a person what has affected on, on our work. So uh, let's now go to the go a little bit further from the past to the present. 
Um, Marcel, uh, is there anything else you would like to like to share about uh, where you are looking at the percent at the moment? Um, yeah, uh, and thank you, thank you, Jana. Once we are looking uh, in the present moment, there's kind of be thankful to the to the last pandemic because it has a reason like waking up Africa regarding the economy. He has shown that right now, even if we have all adopt uh, internet and mobile, we are like forgetting about uh, the data economy around uh, how those data can help us uh, stronger our community and, and give better services. So I would say just to, just to add that now we are all not just aware and we are putting on place that uh, in the future we might have a, a better infrastructure and we are adopting also the 5G so that uh, we, we can take all the benefit around the economy uh, in Africa. That's uh, what I have to add. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so bringing data economy back to the communities, that's one of the core themes today and one of the things I, I definitely need we need to do uh, in the future. Uh, let's slowly move to the smart cities developments and, and to the educational tech developments and these marvelous ladies stay cool, you will not, <laughs> you will get your, your chance very soon. But before, I would like to hear a little bit more from Dixon's uh, point of view about uh, recent developments and where we are at the present. Where do you see most value from the fair data economy thinking? Dixon, please go ahead. Yes, um, I think that uh, recently what we get um, encounters uh, from my uh, jobs on the week, um, there, there, there are more municipality that are willing to improve citizens', citizens well-being through the, uh, the American regulations because now, now that we can handle data more easily. And also uh, some um, enterprise, uh, including maybe the fictitious um, uh, European branch, uh, they are moving to uh, look at how to share data properly so that um, it will improve to employees' um, digital workspace. So I would say um, in, 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 in Japan or even in Cambodia, uh, this Monday I was talking to some of the uh, um, enterprise and they said that uh, they are going to make good use of HRO from Estonia to provide better service to the uh, citizens. So uh, they call it CAMDX, which is the uh, data transformation. So uh, I would say uh, together with uh, trusted um, trustworthy government and, and enterprise, um, we can deliver this uh, fair data economy much more faster than we, we think we can. Because uh, certain places in the world are leapfrogging, and then uh, it takes no time for, for them to adopt to our solution. So, uh, and thank you, Nana, for providing this opportunity to share this information. Thank you. Thanks. And now let's move to the Greater Bay region and see the developments there. Uh, and uh, yes, so Chris, would you like to join? And it would be great if you can leave the both, if you can share both the present. Yes, yeah, thanks, uh, So uh, actually to add on the recent point, uh, um, I more focus on sharing uh, what's happening in China here. Uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, about 20 years ago, so when uh, China joined WTO, uh, it grew, uh, it opened up uh, the business, and, and to our point is that uh, all the data sharing agreement with the US and New York, you have some direction there in Kenya, the world. Uh, but then, uh, most recently, we go to the next company, the last one, and maybe you guys also heard that. Uh, and there's a point that uh, those uh, in the last 10 years, a lot of people, there's a point that you take a little for people that are like how you can answer and whatnot uh, in the region, and uh, they need to kind of uh, monopolize uh, the whole uh, online market. In China, that's where uh, get a lot of attention from the uh, kind of animals, uh, that's where 
last year, uh, 2021, uh, there were two major uh, data security law and data privacy law that are met in China. That's trying to minimize the misuse of personal data in the country. But to my point of view, um, uh, in, in China right now, the situation is the private sharing data is more common than the uh, public data sharing. The commercial company uh, is moving much quicker than the government or public sector, how they use the data, how they cooperate with the third party uh, data vendor. So that's where we, I, I think that uh, it is uh, it's still a lot of room to progress. And uh, to Jen's point, I'm talking about the GBA, uh, we'll be the next slide. Uh, so uh, recently, um, you know, China, China government had a big push of a new concept of the uh, Spark CD cluster, which you can see from the next slide. Um, it's actually, uh, we call it the GBA, the Greater Bay Area uh, concept, which actually consists of uh, you know, the special administrative region of Hong Kong, Macau, and, uh, nice, and, other, and other nice cities in, in the in region, which we call the Pearl uh, River Delta region, which is the south, uh, east southern uh, region in China. And uh, you can see that actually it consists of uh, about 8, 86 million uh, people in the region. And uh, it contributes about over 10% of overall uh, China GDP. So it's a, it's a quite important uh, economic subregion. Uh, within China, and, uh, and this uh, new GPA concept is really uh, want to uh, uh, build the uh, better uh, business, data, people, connectivity across these nice cities. So in order to do that, um, uh, from the next slide, you can see that uh, there's a uh, across uh, you know, industry or, or different uh, different kind of businesses we need to connect. So you can see from the next slide, for example, the financial services, the transportation and logistics, medical services, and also in, in that area, there's a lot of manufacturing um, uh, 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 industry in that region. So how the semi product or finished product uh, shift to the, like Hong Kong and then export to other parts of the world, and then this really need a lot of uh, uh, digital uh, uh, transformations here. So for a lot of international companies that really need to operate or need a business in China, so the data localization, the data connectivity across the city, and also the cross-border data service is really important. So uh, that, that's, um, that's uh, just a quick highlight of uh, the recent development uh, in, uh, regarding smart city in the uh, GDA of China. So back to you, Jen. Okay, thanks Chris. So, I think that smart city side is something where we can definitely bring the data economy close to the citizens and close to the communities and close to the people. Uh, that's the one domain where, where we have lots of things to collaborate for and make our messages much more understandable and relatable to, to the people living in the cities. But now let's move to the, from this uh, tour, let's move back to, to Vanha Satama. Uh, and I have these three pioneers uh, working with the very first moments uh, on my data on these topics. So first, Mariana, let's talk a little bit about educational tech. And, but please share your personal ideas and, and your personal past experience about fair data economy first. Thank you, Jana. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I work for Innobay in data sharing, but I'm also very active in uh, data sovereignty now. And, and that's an initiative where we brought together a couple of uh, great like-minded organizations that all strive for the same thing, which is data sovereignty, enabling people and organizations to, to govern their own data, to know, uh, yeah, to use it in different contexts, to manage their data themselves. And, and if I look at the past, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, optimistic, you know, a couple of years ago there was not a lot and now if you look, we have the data strategy, we have the big five regulations in the EU, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that perspective. And I think we've got a great, um, we strive for human-centric economy and I think we sometimes forget in, in, in Europe that we have this humanistic view 
and also this legal house that we can build upon. So that's, I think, is a yeah, that stands me really optimistic. And um, if, if I would give my one word on data, it would be awareness. Actually, it would be three words, awareness, awareness, and awareness. <laughs> because I think we need awareness with policymakers uh, on, on all levels, but we also need awareness with, uh, with normal, yeah, you know, the citizens and the people. So we have regulation now, we have lots of paper, but now we need action perspective. And, you know, if I look back at, for instance, climate change and CO2, people did not have, did not have action perspective years ago. I mean, what could you do years ago? Um, but now we have action perspective. We can consume goods for, from companies that, that, you know, are green, etc. I think it's the same in data sovereignty. Ooh, am I doing something? I think it's the same in data sovereignty, so we should uh, provide people with action perspective. And for me, the other side of the coin, that same coin, is that we need businesses and organizations to show that action perspective. And there, I think we still need a lot of work to do. So we've come a long way, we've got this regulation, we've got this whole concept of data spaces that is, that is about to hit off. But there are also some challenges, and I, I think we'll also come back to that later, but I think that's for me is really uh, paramount. And then, if I take that to the present, uh, because you asked about education and technology example, um, I'm really glad we already see it hitting off, because I want to uh, share with you an experience from the Netherlands, uh, where we guide this initiative, this Data Space for Education initiative, which is called EduVe, and in that initiative, schools and suppliers of digital educational materials have grouped together, and they together they strive to create a set of agreements or afspraakenstelsel to to really make sure that the sh they share data um, seamlessly in order to help children and in order to. Uh, yeah, make sure the benefits of using digital educational materials in the class are really, yeah, um, that, that you can really, really use it and turn it into the benefits. So we are really creating an ecosystem there. And um, the optimistic thing is that everybody sees it and they are grouped around the table. So it's not, and it's really focused on all the levels. So it's technical functional, operational, and legal agreements. And, and I'm really, um, yeah, I'm really optimistic about that because, I mean, the whole thing that in tech we trust, I think that's a thing from the past. Huh? We, we need the full circle of all kinds of agreements. And I think this, this initiative shows that, uh, that this data space concept is happening. And uh, we, we have the first agreements now in place uh, around privacy. And it's very promising. Good. Um, yeah, I think demand-driven, demand-driven development and, and this uh, mission-driven business, those are very important for, for this bright future. But Tina, uh, since uh, you've been working a long time with this DigiPower investigation and um, also browse through the international developments in AdTech. Uh, how do you see the potential in this in this future and this mission-driven businesses? So, do we have alternatives in place? What could have been done differently? I am optimistic, even though the uh, status at the moment is rather bleak. Um, if I had to pick a word, my word would be distrust. And distrust is the problem that actually hinders innovation in data economy and it hinders people from using, some people from using digital services. We actually surveyed that a year ago in four countries, the Netherlands, Germany, France and Finland. And people said, yes, my distrust, uh, distrust stops me from using uh, digital services. And that is a horrible thing. Uh, we need to get the trust back and to be able to do that, we need marketing people on board. We don't talk about marketing people enough. We don't. 
even though they are a key player in data economy. They are a key player in the business models of the government companies. They are the ones that buy the digital ads. They are the ones that uh, make companies support the current system. So what I would like to see is the CEOs and the CIOs and the strategy directors of companies go to their marketing and talk about their worries. Uh, their worries about the uh, cookie partnering bleeding uh, the company's intelligence capital to the government companies. So by supporting the current system, uh, the companies are actually using intelligence capital every time somebody clicks on their uh, ad. Now, that is ridiculous. So the CEOs need to talk to the marketing people and then they need to start talking with the marketing people to find new solutions. And no, they are not in place. They're, I'm, I'm slightly disappointed because I have background in, in um, marketing, that us marketing people, that we used to be very innovative. You know, we, the, we were the ones always trying to look for new solutions. Now we're stuck in the same old system we have been there for about two decades. It's time to change and find these new solutions. Okay, so we nicely moved to the future already. But still, Taru, you, you have been uh, part of the, when My Data Alliance was founded in 2014, so you have also a very long perspective on the developments. So let's jump into future just now. But what, what's your favorite word when it comes to data and what could we have done better in the past? Yeah, thank you. The word that comes into my mind is DNA as a kind of a code of a human that can be seen as data. And uh, also kind of bring to my mind that data is everywhere and it's everything. And that's also a challenge for us because when we talk about data, so we perceive it differently and we structure it differently. So to find a common ground and find a means to, to make use of it. So, but to say that it's, it's everywhere. And it's said my personal learning curve in my data really started in uh, 2014 when we commissioned, I was working for the Ministry of Transport and Communications, and we commissioned the, the white paper on my data. And I have to say that that's the best investment I've ever proposed in my career, I think. So we have this knowledge base, and uh, also, as Maria said, we have kind of a regulation, it's uh, data economies in the political agenda, or policy agenda, uh, in Finland and also in EU and globally. Uh, so we have these kind of a stepping stones there, and now we have, can build, build on, on that. And seeing here the communities so have been involved in, in, in the My Data Conference and this uh, community, as you said, My Data Alliance that gathered like 40 different like companies in Finland during the uh, years, just to discuss about, kind of share their, their kind of ideas, how they build their models and architectures and, and services. And seeing like those organizations are here, and I think that this is kind of a building now the critical mass that we need in, in this area to become kind of a mainstream. So to the future, I think I'm also optimistic and, and I, I see the bright future now that we are as a community and we and companies are building amazing services and we can see all the solutions in Smart City and uh, so bringing together all the knowledge and then building the interoperability on, on. So I'm hopeful that now it's kind of a <laughs> turning into a reality. Yes, we need good energy and positive energy to make the final final impact. So, um, I asked everyone also to, to make uh, a short slogan that's uh, something as an inspiration for future. So, Taru, I think your suggestion was this who cares slogan. So, would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I think, uh, like here, it, it has been said already quite often that we 
need to involve and engage uh, people. So we talk about human centricity and it's kind of a, a strong principle, but are we really building kind of a, a from the perspective of humans and people and hearing what they really need and kind of a developing and designing services with them, not for them. So I'm, I'm a designer as a, like my, uh, as a, as an education, uh, and um, there the kind of a key principle is to involve uh, those who are kind of uh, impacted or then kind of users of data to, to, to kind of this development works. So, and I think that we should build on the idea that we should really involve people to ask them to what they need, but more of to kind of provide tools and means and services that they can make use of data and that they start to care about data in seeing how it kind of impacts them in everyday life and how they can make use of it and, and kind of thinking it as a, also as a common good that people um, can make good with, with their data. So, and also care, like thinking about the organizations, so um, organization, this there's tensions between organizations and their customer or people, as I think Dina, Dina kind of described really well how this kind of, a, um, how, how kind of companies operate with data and it doesn't meet the needs of, of people. So how to build this collaboration. So caring is, would mean also that we should build kind of a collaboration between organizations and, and their customers. And in the end, like, Again, we come back to this, like you have to hear your customers, how they, what type of concern they have in, in data or what they need or what they want to achieve with data and build services on that. Thanks. And Marianne, what's your pick? Yeah, so I think uh, one is uh, uh, find new ways and focus on the benefits. So I think we see a lot of initiatives, but they all have trouble to scale. And I think one of the reasons is that we need to find new ways of dealing with data and, and find new ways of valorizing data. And I, I, I'd like to quote uh, Tommaso Valletti who said, I'm a bit disappointed mm -hmm. in, 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 you know, uh, we all have the same business model uh, centered around ads and, uh, you know, but we used to build churches, uh, town squares, uh, libraries. Where are we? So I, I really think we need to focus on business models and new ways of valorizing data, and also look at compensation of data. So what I see in, in these data ecosystems, why sometimes it is trouble to scale, is that the benefits of sharing data don't always fall on the ones who take the investments. So, and, and in a pilot situation, you can always overcome that because everybody is honky-dory and happy. But then, when you have to scale, it's about, okay, how are we going to divide the cost, who's taking the cost of the infrastructure, who's taking these costs. And I think we still have a lot of theory and practice work to do there. So I'm really happy to also do that in the ad tech ecosystem. Those are exactly the discussions that we're taking. So that, that is one thing. And the other thing, which is really related to that, is fight the fragmentation. So I really think, and you mentioned the word interoperability, and I think that's a key word also in uh, in, in, in the data space world that we're now trying to kick off, also in, in this uh, conference, we need soft infrastructure, common soft infrastructure. And I'm looking at, you know, when we had, back in the days when we started to build rail, uh, railroads, you know, I mean, first you had all different railroads, and yeah, it was nice, you had a train here and there, but you couldn't connect. But once you have common soft infrastructure, Look at what it did for the U.S. This this train track, you know, this railroad, it sparked a whole economy, a whole country almost. And I think that's what we need to focus on here too: common soft infrastructure, so we have interoperability. So um, that's very smart: common soft infrastructure uh, and bringing the tribes together to Absolutely. go to the market square in the cities and and promote for human centricity. Um, trusted instead of busted. I think that that, that looks like that you. Was, that was mine, trusted instead of busted. Um, that's simply because I think it's time for the companies to make a choice. Do the companies choose?
to continue supporting a system, a uh, system in data economy that erodes our democracies and stops uh, smaller companies from innovating. It is indeed a choice. So what we can do is to choose differently and start thinking about the new business models for us, you know, for each and every company. So that, that I think is one thing. And you can build a superpower from data integrity and trust. Make it your superpower. And uh, by data integrity, I don't mean data has any integrity. You have or you don't, or the companies have or they don't. Data is just bits and bytes. But the companies need to make a choice whether they should be trusted or not. And, and you know, trust is uh, worth some big money. Uh, pe people are more willing to share their data. People are more willing to uh, work with you uh, for your products or for your services if they trust you. Hence, trust it instead of trust. Okay. And then let's move to the Crater Bay region. Uh, how do you see, what's your favorite pick from here? Chris? We can't. You know, China perspective. Um, actually, the biggest data owner in the country is not focused on the actual government. Uh, because, uh, as you guys may know, uh, there's uh, uh, some, a lot of corporate offices and also a lot of government company functions. So, actually, the government is the biggest uh, data owner. So, I think. Uh, uh, no matter how good uh, the commercial or public company, uh, finance or retail, but uh, if we cannot, uh, uh, from the government point of view, the policy, as Marianne mentioned, the, 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 the standard uh, generic infrastructure not in place uh, uh, from the government uh, perspective, uh, I think it, uh, the, the, the collective data use or the uh, the, the, the maximize the data use is not is not uh, it's not that easy. Yeah. Thanks. And Dixon, you have been successful in incorporating fair data practices into the corporate practices. But uh, of those slogans, what's your favorite? What's your key takeaway from, from the session <laughs> to the audience? Yeah. What? Mine would be make it actionable for real people because um, as, a, as a design, uh, as a software developer or designer, uh, we only concentrate on developing the, the innovative technology part, but forget about our customers sometimes. But um, nowadays, um, in order to ask people to join our board with the uh, fair data economy, we have to make sure that they have a brand new user experience that is totally different from Gaia. And then we have to make sure that they understand it easily, and we don't have them to um, to have a rocket science degree to understand what's um, fair and not fair. So uh, I would say actionable for real people and for everyone, even simple enough for children, is it's what we have to do. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Dixon. And Marcel, what was your favorite pick? Uh, I think I'm, I'm much more aligned with, with, uh, with Dixon regarding making actionable for real people. Because in our environment, we really like that that's part. And when it comes even to us, we still need to, to go through data literacy, which really kind of accept in our environment. Even if that there started to be a, a kind of shift regarding data literacy. And adding to the, the actionable part, we need to have um, uh, the, the privacy, the, the, the laws, the framework that can help us leverage all the, the opportunities that, that, that is bringing up the uh, data economy. Not only in the economy, but also uh, when, it, when it comes to social services. Uh, the last report, the last report showed that uh, we like, for example, in Africa, just identification. And we think that uh, with, with all that's going on around the data, it will be a, a really good point for a government to put us, uh, to put that kind of consistent and while integrating as a citizen to the decision making, they will have great trust and with their contribution, will have like um, ownership of the of the laws of the framework.
protection world and the privacy act that we we all that ecosystem will be really a, a good point for us to take all the benefit of the of the data economy for our countries and for our country. Thank you. Thanks. We are just about to close the session, but uh, I, as I started, I think it's really time to analyze and learn from each other what, what's happened across the, across the different, different continents, learn from each other, build our common messages, break the bubbles being uh, identity management tribe or being a regulate, regulator tribe or the My Data Operator Stripe, we need to work together, make some sense making and common messaging for the policy makers, but most of all for the individuals. So uh, I think that if you have anything, one word you want to add, you still have time. Something. If not, then I will close this session. This was a really speed way across the or round round trip uh, international round trip in 40 minutes but i hope that you enjoy it and thanks for our remote panelists and thanks to our great ladies on stage discussing the past, present, and the future of fairness in data-driven business. And now we will have a coffee break. And after the break, we will have a panel about disrupting GAFM e-commerce models. And see.